Welcome everyone to um, this event for the 50th anniversary of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation. Here is a beautiful logo that was made by our past president, uh, Neil Sanderson. Uh, uh, and most of the organization of this event, I had to say, was done by Niels uh, in the past few months. Um, I want to, uh, I don't want to steal much of your time because we have outstanding speakers today who know much more about the history of the society than I do. But uh, just want to point out that uh, the society is very closely connected with the GR conferences, as I bet you all know. The, first conference officially is the one in Chapel Hill from 1957. And in fact, one could argue that um, the first GR conference was the one organized in Bern in 1955 to celebrate the 50th year of the Annus Mirabilis of Einstein in 1905. Uh, but uh, as you can see, we are celebrating today the 50th anniversary because the society as we know it now was in fact founded in 1971 at the GR conference in Copenhagen. And before that, uh, um, the uh, conferences had been run by what was called the International Committee on General Relativity and Gravitation. And I'm sure that Roberto, Virginia, and the others today will tell us much more about why this happened and uh, all of the interesting implications of the change in name of the society and uh, the history behind it. Um, I have to say that uh, um, there is one thing that I want to steal from Niels because I think it's very nice and it's related with John Wheeler, who was one of the main uh, responsible or, or the people who were most responsible for the renaissance of general relativity. You see here a beautiful photo of John, who by the way got his doctorate here at Johns Hopkins in 1933. And uh, um, there's this thing that I learned from Niels, which is that in 1976, John Wheeler deposited his papers with the American Philosophical Society. And in addition to the papers, he also donated several hundred books, many of which were technical books about uh, uh, general relativity, but some uh, were not. And in particular, there was a copy of Alice in Wonderland that he got as a birthday present uh, at the GR conference in 1971, in which the society uh, was founded. And um, this book is signed by many prominent people, including, as you can see here, Kip Thorne, Roger Penrose, and Virginia Trimble. And uh, I'm sure that Virginia will have a first-hand account of what happened and why the society was founded. Our speakers today, I want to uh, uh, give you a very short introduction of why uh, we uh, chose to have Roberto in Virginia and then a video by Stan Deser. Um, Roberto literally wrote the book on uh, the st uh, story of how the general relativity community came together after uh, the Second World War. And uh, if you haven't read the book, I strongly encourage you to do it. It's a beautiful book. Uh, it reads like a spy story in parts. Um, Virginia, as you probably know, uh, is the woman who knows everything about the universe because she has kept uh, a record of every, every astronomy paper that was ever published for uh, a long period of time. And she was there to witness firsthand many of the events that Roberto will talk about. And at the end, uh, we will have a video um, that was recorded um, by Stan Deser, that of course we thank uh, for, for doing this. Um, the video is based on personal recollections, and you can find some of those in another very beautiful book, Forks in the Road, uh, his autobiography. And again, if you haven't read it yet, I strongly encourage you to do so because it's a great read. I'll stop sharing, I'll get out of the way, and uh, I welcome Roberto to start and tell us more about the history of the society at this point. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I start sharing the screen. I cannot do two things at the same time. So just wait a second, please. Okay, should be fine, right? Yeah. Okay, good. thanks a lot. I'm very excited to give this um, uh, this survey of the early history of the pre-society uh, from the beginning of the attempt to build an international community after World War II up to the uh, foundation of the society. As a friend of mine told to the 
uh, to the central anniversary of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics a few months ago. It's very uh, dangerous to invite historians to their own uh, birthday celebration because they usually tell that it's not the right time to celebrate. It should be maybe chosen a different date. And maybe I will have to say something a little bit similar, but one that actually the society was uh, formally established. So what is the society? No, everybody of you knows very well, better than me, but uh, from that side, the society is established to promote the study of general relativity and gravitation and to exchange information in the interest of its members and the profession. And how do you do that? It organizing a, tri a triennial international conference, publishing a journal called General Relativity and Gravitation, sponsors a bulletin and representing its research community international science policy through the UPAP, acting as responsible commission for our other uh, conferences. What I will try to talk today, uh, it's um, without trying to give any uh, uh, any completeness in my short survey, is to understand how this came about, how each single step was built in a very interesting time for general relativity. The time that one of the people in the audience, Clifford Wild, called the Renaissance of Generativity. This is an incredibly interesting time in the history of the uh, relati general relativity and gravitation theory or gravitation also experiment as a field, because as Clifford Wild wrote in 18 uh, in 1986, nine of this paper, but during this period. Uh, in this period, the Renaissance, the theory had changed the status completely. It was considered mostly by a theoretical physicists to be a formalistic, sterile subject until the 1950s. And by 1970, and I quote Clifford, it had become one of the most active and excited branches of physics. And this period of a change of status of the theory is usually compared to what happened previously in the previous 30 years, a period that John Eisenstein, another historian of physics, a colleague of mine, had called the low water mark of generativity. Usually, these pictures is agreed about by historians of physics, also by physicists themselves. There are different views about what characterized this passage, which was social, but also in a way conceptual or, uh, concerning the field itself between the low water mark and the Renaissance, but what is certain that it, what changed completely is the connection between scholars, scientists working in the field. In this period, a, com a, com a community started to be built. It was a very momentous project. It was very quick and it was very important in forming a field which is now called generativity and gravitation. And now I start from the first step, which is without doubt, the conference in Bern. So the story started the community building activity in 1953, actually, when André Mercier, then uh, the chair of theoretical physics at the University of Bern, had the idea to organize a conference to, uh, to celebrate, as Emanuele told, the 50th anniversary of Einstein's writing of the special relativity paper on electrodynamics of moving bodies when he was a third class patent officer at Bern 50 years earlier in 1905. So to say the least, <laughs> the uh, Mercedes colleagues at Bern were less than enthusiastic, but he was able to enroll the support of Wolfgang Pauli, then uh, Professor at Zurich, who became the chairman of the conference while Mercier uh, acted as a secretary, and they were able to um, eventually, step after step, build the support uh, on the idea of having a conference uh, dedicated only to topics related to generative. That this was the first conference ever in the world that was organized internationally on a topic related to general relativity. Now, uh, it's important, no, uh, the importance of the local context cannot be uh, ever overestimated. The organizers were deeply interested in foundational issues, for example, for example both Mercier and, uh, and Wolfgang Pauli, but even more importantly, Mercier had a very strong committing on the, um, commitment in using science as a way to improve relations 
on connectivity between people in a very strained political situation. So he also intended international conferences in the period as uh, action uh, that can be called SAS diplomacy exercises, we call we would we'll call this today. Uh, moreover, Pauli imposed an elitist conception of the conferences. He pretended that only uh, very well-known figures in this generativity to be invited to give plenary talks, plus others that could be invited when supported by uh, some recognized national communities, for example, academies of science. So this gave a very strong... Uh, a very strong image of the conference as being an elitist conference that was made not only to uh, promote a field but also to build connection between scientists and in this attempt the timing and place was very important because it occurred uh, in a period of very slight uh, reapproachment between the East and the West following the end of the Korean War and the death of Stalin, which, uh, um, which implied a change in the foreign policies in the U in USSR and the beginning of connectivity in different scientific and political events between uh, um, the East and the West. And you can see in the slide two important event which occurred both in Switzerland and very close, actually a little bit later, of the conference in Bern. So the conference in Bern is to be situated in this kind of political environment in which Switzerland was creating for itself the role of the neutral place for uh, uh, allowing the encounters between Eastern and Western politics politicians, but also scientists. And this was explicitly recognized by some conference participants. Uh, the Bern Conference was invested by a multitude, multitude of meanings, uh, which went beyond the purely scientific gathering. As you can see from this, um, this kind of one of the first pages of the conference, it was also understood as being an event in which scientists were also representative of nations and went to do an act of peace. But also this kind of more diplomatic or political meaning, of course, the conference had an important uh, scientific impact on the field in, because the people who gathered there uh, we were able to recognize that the field was actually alive, more alive than they expected, but more importantly, that there were important issues in classical generativity which had not been answered, and it was necessary to answer these questions in order to go beyond. Because as you know, uh, the research at the time was characterized by a multi multitude of approaches which were mostly aimed at going beyond GR, a quantization of gravitational field, the attempt to unify electromagnetic and gravitational fields, or even the attempt at uh, building alternative views of cosmology, not properly relativistic. So people recognized the field of alive, and this led this recognition apart from the recognition that generativity can actually be an important field to build connectivity among people working on different sides of the Iron Curtain. So it was recognized that it was important to go ahead with this kind of, uh, of conferences. Moreover, that it is conception of the Bern Conference had made it impossible for many young American relativity experts to attend the Bern meeting. Also, if you think not even John Wheeler, who was starting to be a major figure in, in GR in the US, even he was not at the Bern Conference. So feeling that they've been the Bern Conference had many uh, many issues in the decision how um, how the, the the people had been invited, the decisions about the invited speakers, uh, the Americans wanted to do uh, almost immediately a similar event, and they took the occasion as the foundation of the Institute of Field Physics at uh, University of Capilano in Chapelil, and the event happened in January 1957. So in doing this event, the second conf international conference, which was later called GR1, uh, the organizer used a different organizational style, uh, an organizational style that they considered 
more close as an expression of a more open and democratic academic culture as they thought the academic one was with respect to the old style uh, continental European one. Without the involvement of any national academy in, in the organization or in, in suggesting speaker and giving equal time to all speaker, whatever their academic status. So while uh, the meeting was successful in Dubitri from the scientific standpoint, as far as the international character of the gathering is concerned, the Chapley Conference had various shortcomings. Uh, one of these was, of course, political, but not only political, but also financial, um, due to financial reason, namely that many scientists, and not scientists from Eastern European country could attend this conference. Even though the organizer wanted to organize, differentiate their event from the Bern conference, uh, those who attended them, of course, felt the strong continuity. And soon after the end of the conference, French scientist Andrei Liknerowitz and Marie Antoinette Tonella immediately proposed to organize the third conference in France, which was done at uh, Royamont near Paris in 59. In doing so, in the organization of the third conference, they tried to realize the best synthesis they could of the experience gained with the previous two conferences. And they, I would say, succeeded. The conference was a platform in which a sizable number of American, Western European, and Western European experts in general activity could actually meet for the first time. And at the same time, the organizer maintained the democratic character of the Chapel Hill Conference. The enthusiasm for those who attended the Rayomon Conference was so great that at the end of the conference, one of um, the scholars who had participated to the three of them, Herman Bondi, then a leading um, a group on gravitational and theoretical gravitational waves, research on theoretical gravitational waves at King's College, Herman Bondi, proposed actually to institutionalize this attempt to create a group of scholars who would uh, take the charge of organizing this conference, giving birth to what was called the International Committee on General Relativity and Gravitation, right at the Royal Moon Conference. Now, uh, the guiding principle for the establishment of this committee was to the need to that the committee should be representative of both the scientific agendas, which were very different at the time in the different research centers, but also representative of the different national context in which uh, research on generativity and gravitation was pursued at the time. However, if you look at the countries represented by, by the members of the committee, uh, in spite of the idea to create a body really representative of most scientific approaches and most national communities, there are important missing uh, countries. One of it is, of course, India, which had uh, a couple of important research centers at the time, but India at the time was not part of this attempt to build, um, mm -hmm. mostly for financial reason, was not part uh, there is a noise. Uh, it was not part of this attempt, early attempt to be the international community, probably mostly for, uh, for financial reason. And the second missing um, country is, of course, Germany, where there were at least two strong groups working um, both sides of the, the Iron Curtain, one in Hamburg led by Pascual Jordan and the other in East Berlin led by Achilles Papa Petru. And they are not present. Now, I Cannot say because I haven't found a strong evidence why, but it's pretty fairly, uh, it's fair to assume that were mostly for political reason. Pascual Jordan was an incredibly controversial figure at the time. Uh, it was very known at the time his involvement, his support of the Nazi regime. But most, in, most importantly, at the time, he was getting involved. He was getting involved again in politics with the CDU, and he was supporting uh, supporting the uh, uh, the proposal to be the topic weapon in West Germany. So it was still a very controversial figure. And uh, while for this Germany, I think that the problem was not. Uh, was that East Germany was not recognized at the time and the committee didn't want, the people in the committee didn't want at the time to, um, to be involved in any political issue that could be a problem for the activities, scientific activities of the committee. 
Now, something that is related that was happening at the problem, uh, I must say that there is a little noise from someone in the audience. So if you can be muted, it would be a little bit better. It's things I, I try. Yeah, uh, thanks, Roberto. I'm trying to mute when people leave their uh, microphones on. I'm sorry. No, no, that. just uh, that there is a noise. It's a little bit. Uh, now, what's happening at the time in terms of community building? This is an image I made. These are some research centers in uh, Europe, uh, United States, and also Israel. Uh, these centers were already established, on the verge of being established in the mid 1950s, right at the beginning of the so called Renaissance. And this is the connectivity which increased between 55 and 62 during the period of the, of the first four conferences. Uh, each link between the search centers is uh, is a representation of one, one scholar, at least one scholar, who was at both centers, when two centers are related, at least three months in this uh, uh, six-year period. So you can see that from 55, where there was no connection at all, until 62, there was an incredibly uh, increase of the connectivity. And of course, if people, early research scholars moved from one place to another, they brought with them questions, tools, methods, research agendas. And this, of course, creates a much better sense that there was a unique field called generativity, which was pursued by this community that was emerging. Now, the field was growing, the connectivity was growing, the, 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 the representation of physicists that there was actually a scientific field was growing, the perception. So one problem was what actually was the, the duty of the committee besides organizing international conferences. Uh, uh, one of the targets of the International Committee was to challenge the dispersion still felt about the various research agendas, about the difficulties to be informed about the different publication, and this was solved by publishing a bulletin since 1962, which was done by uh, essentially by Mercier with his assistance, uh, assistance in Bern. Mercier became immediately the permanent secretary of the society, so was uh, extremely important important in, in getting the community going and also, of course, the, uh, the decision to organize the international conferences in a stable manner, uh, every, manner every three years. Uh, uh, sorry. Is it problem? Okay. Oh, beyond that, Mercier was also very interested, as I said, to use science uh, as, a, as a way to improve relations between people. So he also was, in a way, motivated by strong belief in the role of science international uh, peace. Uh, uh, and that was one of the attempt he tried to, in one of the uh, duties that he felt he was pursuing through his position. Now, while there was a strong agreement among the members of the committee that the committee was useful to coordinate the feed, that the committee was useful to uh, allow the meeting among scholars. So the committee was useful in shaping the field that was growing, that was becoming a part um, that um, a, a truly, a truly um, established field in, 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 in science there were many tensions. Uh, even before the establishment of the committee, uh, the explicit community building activities taking place since the Bern Conference were shaped by regional and cultural divisions. And these were symbolized by the opposed uh, styles, cultural styles, cultural academic styles of the Bern and the Chapelier Conferences. Uh, after the establishment of the committee, this contrast was made explicit by Rosenfeld, uh, Leon Rosenfeld and Christian Moller, both in Denmark. And they strongly argued in favor of applying so formal restriction, both in the number of participants who could attend the conferences and also in the number of accepted subjects for the discussion in such conferences. In practice, this meant that the only invited, only invited scholars could attend international conferences on GLG. And this gave a committee an enormous power in defining the most relevant lens of research to be pursued. 
And this was, of course, something that was unbearable in a, from, a certain, from a certain point of view to American scholars, in particular the youngest one who were coming in the field just in this moment, in a greater, greater number. But this policy was accepted by the committee in, uh, in spite of opposition of some. For Mercier himself, who was the permanent secretary and had a, a huge role in the activities of the committee, uh, the committee itself was much more than organizational structures. It assumed the committee, the spiritual management of the conferences. It could recommend about the works to be pursued. So this is a seemingly, seemingly as transcendental romantic view of the committee uh, with the strong decision-making power. And this, again, was unbearable, almost unacceptable to a younger generation of scholars, especially in the Anglo-American academic culture. They were rapidly making progress in the field and started considering the International Committee as a self-appointed group, which no one had actually elected. They, were, they had elected themselves, decided what were the important feed to be pursued, decided who were the important person to be invited, and the people start to ask it, who had elected them to make this decision. So this was not simply, of course, a generational conflict, but it also entailed deeper divisions concerning the different views of the priorities of general relativity and gravitation as a field. And this became particularly evident in the debate concerning which macro discipline general relativity belonged to, namely the the issue of the preferential connection between general relativity and physics rather than mathematics, astronomy, mechanics, and so on. Uh, American physicists, in particular, most notably, John Wheeler, held and defended very clearly the views that generativity should be restored as soon as possible to where it belonged, namely physics. This is also very clear if you look at the personal uh, notebook on um, John Wheeler on general relativity, on his teaching on general relativity, which started already in 52, where he started very clearly that in his teaching, he will try to um, uh, hi highlight how many tie-ups with many tie-ups with other fields of physics. But not all members of the committee agreed with this view. Uh, this surfaced quite a few times in the discussion on whether uh, whether to join an international union, in particular, whether it would be wise to join officially the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. The IUPAP had officially sponsored the International Conferences of Relativistic Theory uh, of Gravitation since the beginning, since the Bern Conference, or even more officially during from the Chaplin Conference on World. And after the establishment of the committee as the organizing official body of such conferences, uh, IUPAP officers asked the committee, well, what, what should then be our official relations now that there is an official commission? And in 1965, they discussed quite openly about whether it should be associated immediately as an affiliated commission of the UPAT or not. And while some American physicists were eager to promote this affiliation, mathematicians from continental Europe were strongly opposed to this, uh, um, to this uh, uh, institutional uh, change. An institutional, the, 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 the reason was that an institutional affiliation with the UPAP would have implied that generativity was associated only with physics. And they argued, in particular, Lichnerowitz, that GR was intimately related to many different disciplinary domains. For example, the UPAP was just one of the international unions to which the committee could adhere, the others being the Astronomy Union, the uh, Mechanical Union, and the uh, Mathematical, of course, the Mathematical Union. And this disagreement led the matter unsettled for other 10 years. This is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, uh, a minus of, of a discussion in 65. They will join only after the establishment of the society in the, in the 1970s. Now, while the tension of scientific nature or the generational conflicts or concerning different academic cultures characterize the first eight years of the life, the committee was worked very well concerning how to uh, work 
in spite of the political divide of the Cold War. They made a great work in allowing people from the different sides of the Iron Curtain to cooperate and organize international conferences. In fact, the 62 conferences was held in Warsaw and the Yablon. So this suddenly changed in the period 67, 68. In September 68, the first international conference in the Soviet Union had been planned under the chairmanship of a uh, committee member, Vladimir Fock, who was present since the um, Bern conference, not of course in Chapril, but he was present, present since the beginning of this community building activity, Vladimir Fock. So, as you can see in, in September 68, um, since the year earlier when it was decided, uh, there was much expectation among uh, relativity scholars about the conference. It was a very exciting year, a few years after the discovery of quasars, uh, just a couple of years after the uh, establishment of the, the discovery of the cosmic background radiation. And of course, uh, there were um, the Joe Weber attempt to uh, find experimental um, to, 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 do, to do experimental tests on uh, gravitational radiation. So there were very exciting uh, things going on. And they were very excited about the, about the first time to go in the Soviet Union. But then at the end, many invited scholars boycotted the conference and for two different political reasons. So the first one was that after the Six Day War, uh, the Soviet Union disrupted diplomatic relations with Israel. And this made it very difficult, not to say impossible, for uh, scholars in the Soviet Union to send invitation um, to Israeli scholars, to the Israeli scholars who had been chosen to be invited by the committee, namely Nathan Rosen, Asher Peres, and Moshe Kormeli. So they didn't even try because they know that they will never get the visa to uh, join the conference. Uh, being an international body that supported international conferences, this was not acceptable. It was not acceptable for the committee to sponsor a conference that excluded scholars for political reasons. And so uh, when Bond, when it became clear that the invitation were not sent for political reasons, Bondi had a phone conversation with Vladimir Fock, and they came to agree that at least one Israeli scholar, and what we Fock chose Paris, one, at least one Israeli uh, relativity scholar had to be invited to the, uh, the Tbilisi conference in, in the GR5, in, in, in uh, the GR5 uh, in, in, in Soviet Union, in Georgia. Uh, this happened in July, by the end of August, the invitation had not been sent and this happened. Uh, forces for the Porsche um, Pact invaded Czechoslovakia. And this created, of course, a huge reaction, shocked many in the European scientific community, not only in the scientific community also. And then Mercier reacted in a very dramatic way and unexpected by many, many standards at the time. So he sent a telegram asking to boycott the Tbilisi conference for political reasons after the, the invasion of Prague. Uh, and he did so without having uh, be able to reach Bondi to decide the common strategy. And this was quite a radical move for a secretary of a supposedly neutral international scientific institution. And of course, even more strongly, um, uh, even more strong because it was done by Mercier, who was one of those who worked more intensively to build uh, international agreement and dialogue among people in the in general relativity and gravitation community. Of course, Bondi didn't agree at all with Mercier, uh, with Mercier Telegram. And in fact, for him, the only problem was the invitation of Israeli scholar. And when Paris finally got the invitation a few days before the conference started, for Bondi, the crisis was solved. The, 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 the TPC conference became a fully official conference of the International uh, Committee. And so there were, for him, no other reason to boycott the conference. Now, Paris at the end couldn't actually go to the TPC conference because he didn't get the visa. 
uh, but this was a uh, second matter at the end the conference was held as an international uh, as, a, as a conference of the of the of the of the committee in spite of uh, Bondi's views and Bondi's telegram, many had already decided not to go to the conference for the different views, either in protest of the treatment of Israeli scholars or uh, uh, as a protest uh, against the invasion of, of Prague. After the TBC conference, in which again only a few scholars, most notably Wheeler and his group from the US, uh, went, went, a few scholars from the West, Members in the committee lamented the total lack of coordination with respect to political matter. Uh, they lamented that was in particular Peter Bergman lamented that, that it was impossible to provide a unified response to political events, and this made uh, a mess essentially to how to react to these uh, political events and endangered the continuation of the activities of the committee. So in that moment, one of the committee's task was try to understand what was the boundary between scientific and political matter in the Organization of International Science. And that, of course, was very complex. Bondi tried to make a definitive statement, a statement on what had happened and uh, clarifying that for international organization, the only acceptable reason not to attend the TBC conference was the refusal to grant participations to scholars for from one country for political reasons. All other motivations to boycott the meetings could not be acceptable by an international committee. And the rationale was that, they quote, if one allowed scientific meetings to be used as an arena for political demonstration, then, and they quote, indignation over Vietnam would make out the USA, indignation over atom tests would make out France, over Nigerian arm rails sales would make out the UK, and we would have to hold our meetings in the outer space. So with this statement, just to give the broader context, Bondi was de facto just following a rule that was already established in the international unions and the International Council of Scientific Unions. That was the rule concerning the free circulation of scientists. This um, implied that the sponsoring of conference by these unions should be granted if there were no uh, political discrimination. So that scientists from any country could join a specific conference sponsored by this international organization. Now, a, a little digression, uh, it was very dramatic times. It was clear that something had to change and Merce tried to change the matter in a way that was, uh, 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 um, was, was very different from what others were trying to do. Namely, he uh, made many efforts to establish a journal devoted solely to general relativity and gravitation. Uh, there were no, no journal of the field. Uh, Infad had already proposed to establish such a journal in 62, and now in 1970, after all this uh, tension and after Merce uh, had already asked whether he should uh, should retire in view in view of, the, of his position during the the TBC conference, um, but his his his, his request was. Uh, denied, he was asked to continue to work as the permanent secretary. So he worked to establish the journal. But this was, um, there were quite a lot of contention as whether this was the right uh, strategy to promote the field. And the reason was again, that many in the US considered uh, an issue, a problem, the fact that general relativity was building its own readership while they should work mostly to connect to the other uh, other areas of physics. We see here a letter from uh, some words from a letter by Peter Bergman to Herman Bondi, who was still the, who was not the president, no longer the president in, uh, in, uh, in 69, was Falk, but he was trying to convince Bondi, to convince Mercier to um, leave out the, the journal, to not to publish the journal, at least not to publish the journal as a, as, a, as a journal of the International Committee. And now I come back to the community building activity. So the birth of International Society and where things became more, uh, even more controversial. 
uh, in preparation of the meeting, and then Regina will talk more, more about the meeting itself. I give the, the, the long view, the long history of how the committee became the society. In preparation of the conference that was held in Copenhagen in 1971, the political clash made the previous tension even more explosive. <laughs> The pressure of those scholars, younger scholars in particular, who still felt excluded by the important decisions taken by this elite group, led to a deep restructuration of the committee. There were dramatic meetings, three meetings during the Copenhagen conference, and it was decided that the time was ripe for the establishment of a new institutional body, a society open to all experts who wish to join it, similar to other national physical society, or take, um, taking as an example, the recently established European Physical Society, which was established uh, right in a few years earlier, in 68. In order not to create a too disruptive change, the old committee would become uh, the executive committee of the society, but the members would gradually be substituted through democratic election by members elected by the society at large. Also, and this was two issues that were strongly related, it was decided to hold the next conference in uh, Israel, in Haifa. This is also as a way to, uh, to excuse the committee with what happened in Tbilisi. This was strongly requested by Rosen's, Rosen uh, also before the Copenhagen conference. Both this change, both, both, both these decisions, both the change of this institutional structure from the committee to, the, uh, to a society, uh, also, the place where it would be established, because the society was not established in Copenhagen, it was de decided to establish a society, but it was not made the official decision, the official vote on this statue. It was decided that the society would have been funded in the next meeting, in 74, in Haifa, Israel. See, both these decisions were very problematic for Soviet Union scholars, but in general for all Soviet bloc scholars. Also, there were elections that involved the Soviet scholars, so also the East German representative who was traitor and was uh, substituted to democratic election by Dakur, and these were not accepted um, both by East German scholars, some East German scholars and the uh, some Soviet Union uh, members of the Soviet Union group. In fact, in, during the General Assembly, the ad hoc General Assembly that was called to discuss the proposal of the society that was open to all participants at the Copenhagen Conference, Soviet scholars were vehemently attacked by Ivor Robbins for the unfair treatment of the Israeli colleagues in 68. At that point, the Soviet delegation abandoned uh, mass the ad hoc assembly. And the same did if, if quite a few scholars of the Soviet bloc countries. So, of course, so there was a decision, but there was not an agreement on decision. In particular, there were groups that strongly opposed this decision. So the fo following months were quite crucial in order to keep the uh, uh, proposed society open also to the Eastern colleagues, even though some colleagues were elected at the end there were opposition, strong opposition within these groups from the central, from the central organization, the Soviet Union in East Germany and so on. Uh, so there were there were many, many discussion through letters in the following months. Mercier and Moller, Christian Moller, who was the was the new president after the Copenhagen conference, tried to find a mediation between the parts and uh, to understand how was it possible um, to make a creation of the society in a place different from Israel that was the uh, venue of the next conference? Because the, it, that would have been impossible for Soviet bloc scholars to attend the conference and then to join the society at the beginning. That was, uh, would have been a big failure for the attempt to build an international, truly international uh, community of relativists. And this uh, came with the final uh, decision. There was a committee uh, that was uh, built um, to write the, the, the draft statute and try to solve these issues. And the final resolution after months of harsh controversy was to create a hybrid society, which allowed both for individual members, which was what, what 
was the request for most younger uh, Anglo-American scholars, but not only them, and also corporate membership, which would have allowed the membership of uh, scholars from the Eastern Bloc through their institutions. This rule could make it feasible for Soviet Bloc scholars to adhere. Uh, this one is clear by Kip Thorne, who was one of the members of this committee, in his letter to Shama, who was another member of the Committee on the Statue, when he wrote and they quote, the Soviet bureaucracy insisted on regarding all such organizations as composed of national delegation. delegation. Uh, somehow a constitution must be drafted in a way which makes it perfectly clear that ours is an organization of individual scientists. But the phraseology should probably be such that Soviet bureaucrats can misinterpret it if they wish. And this was the draft statute which was sent in November 72 also with the famous letter in which Mercier for the first time, I think, uh, wrote to the relative, relativist throughout the world, which I now see that is used today, also today, but there were still controversy, this, this constitution still to change, and that there were still the problem how, where to fund the society, the final decision was to fund the society by mail. So the proposal by Moller was that the, uh, the committee uh, accepted proposal by Moore that the society was to be established as soon as they had received 150 written consents from at least 10 different nations. And this happened to be very precise before the 7th January of 1974, which is also nice for me because it's the day before I was born, when Mercier informed Moller that the minimum number of members had reached, had been reached. The society could then be officially declared into existence. So you have an exact day of the birth, which is the 7th January 74. Among the members, there were also scientists from the Eastern Bloc, in particular the scientists of the Soviet Academy of Science. And this was a clear sign that the Soviet authorities had if I eventually approved the society in spite of the ash controversy that had been uh, shaped the discussion in the previous uh, years. So uh, as uh, Emanuele said, I wrote all this stuff in a book, which is much more complete. And I just tried to give a survey in uh, 40 minutes. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks, Roberto. It was a great talk. Um, I ask people to put their questions in the chat, but I don't see any questions in the chat. If you have questions for Roberto right now, please open your mic and ask them. Um, and if you don't, we can move on with Virginia. So I have a quick question. Sure. Hi, Manuela. Hello, Virginia. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Right. So my question to uh, is. Um, uh, if uh, he will say a bit more about the role of Kip Thorne, he, which he quoted, uh, uh, because in his book, Thorne um, on War Space Time, he tells a lot about uh, his, uh, his participation in this contact with the Soviet Union because they were traveling uh, and meeting uh, with the Zel people of the Zeldovich group. In fact, to the point that in his book, uh, Thorne called them uh, the three tribes, uh, the Shamanians uh, from England, <laughs> the followers of Danish Shama, the Willerians and the Zeldovicians. So it's interesting to see what uh, Roberto can say a bit more. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know if Virginia will also talk about Kipto's um, Kip role. He had a very huge role, in fact, um, that this is correct. Uh, why was so? He was one, as I said, in the Tbilisi conference, there were some who uh, joined, um, attended the conference, and they were mostly from groups close to John Wheeler. And this means also Kip Thorne went, went to the Tbilisi conference and made huge contact that started to build connections, especially, especially with Vladimir Brzezinski. Now, during the conference in 1971, when the uh, Soviet group went out of the room, Kip Thorne, behind the scene, tried to convince them to come back, and he was able to 
convince eventually that at least Branjinsky was sent back to the room. So in a way, Kipton and Branjinsky became the link in this very strong moment of tension. So I would not say much more, but Ton was crucial as an individual in this moment of difficulty because of his strong connection with the Soviet group. He tried actually to, um, to continue the dialogue in spite of the strong, uh, dramatic, um, uh, moment after the Soviet delegation had actually went away from the room. Uh, and this, of course, occurred also in the following months when there was the attempt to write the statue. Kip Thorn, as I said, was one of the members of the committee, and Vladimir Brzezinski was the Soviet member of the committee. So there was a strong connection between these two uh, scientists who made quite a lot of efforts, so which is a diplomatic one to build a society. Uh, I just uh, stop here because, of course, the time is going ahead, but uh, keep on, yes, at a huge role. I, I would just like to point out that Kip is here, so I don't okay, know if... So, so maybe Kip knows much more than... <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if he wants to... Well, I'll just say that uh, all that you have said is, is correct, and uh, it was a very exciting and delicate time, and uh, we owe a lot to Braginsky for uh, serving as a major bridge to hold this thing together. Thank you, Kip. Uh, there is one raised hand from Igor Pikowski. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, really wonderful uh, talk, very interesting. I was wondering, maybe a bit tangential, but I was wondering if you could comment on the meetings that uh, James Anderson was organizing in the early days, uh, 50s or 60s, um, maybe how they fit or the Stevens relativity meetings, how, if, if there's something you can say about that? Uh, the Syracuse Colloquium on General Relativity, you mean? It, not, not Syracuse, it was at Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, so, so, so the, the Stevens, so, so, the Stevens Institute. Yeah, okay, but that was very central for, 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 for the uh, Eastern, uh, Northeastern community of uh, scholars on general relativity, that was central to that community, uh, much less from the international side. I mean, the, the, it was two different activities. There, they meet, they discuss one paper at the time, and it was very important to uh, build the connection between the groups there, in particular from the Syracuse group, this is why I... <laughs> I got confused, and the uh, the group in Princeton where was under the leadership uh, of, of John Wheeler. So they, they were very important in uh, in uh, in connecting the work which were being done in some major centers in the United States. But this was a local, so it had a very different uh, uh, a very different. Um, Goal, I also would say that they didn't have a goal like Mercier stressed quite a few times of also bridging between the communities which could not be reached, were not local communities, not regional communities, not national communities, but was an attempt to, to uh, support the field at the international level when the international uh, science was being built again after World War II. So it was a, a pivotal time in which scientists, the international way was being built and the conferences and then the committee played a, a huge role in trying to build the generativity in this momentum of international science. But apart from that, of course, the work on the at uh, the Stevens Institute was very, was very important um, at the scientific level. A lot of discussion done then made an uh, important contribution later in the development of the field. There is one last question from David Garfinkel, and then we shall move on to Virginia. Thank you, Robert. Uh yeah, so uh, thank you for, for a wonderful talk. Um, so, I mean, the the sort of formal, um, you know, organization building activities that you've documented here are, are, are certainly very important, but one could argue that the, you know, Renaissance in general relativity, um, you know, um, was driven mainly by, um, you know, relevant astrophysical discoveries like the cosmic microwave background, um, pulsars and, and quasars. Can you say anything about how, you know, this sort of formal organizational building interacted with 
these astrophysical discoveries and building the community? Uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I mean, I worked quite a lot on general relativity from the historical perspective. There are different views. Mm, one, of, one of it is the, the importance of the astrophysical discovery. I would point out that the astrophysical discovery played a role later uh, than this early attempt to build the community. There were major advances from the theoretical side including the work of uh, Stanley Deser or Pirani on the gravitational waves on the entire Bondi group of even Perot's. So there were quite major advances from the theoretical level, which started earlier. So we cannot assume that the, the astrophysical discovery per se were the major driver. Were the major driver in changing the nature of the general relativity renaissance that was occurring at the level of social um, social connectivity and increasing perception of the importance of the field. So there were many things going on and the discovery of quasar and then cosmic background radiation and then pulsar simply changed the field and put it much closer to astrophysics, essentially with the uh, beginning of relativistic astrophysics. Now, things at the time in the 1960s, when the, the the quasar was discovered. If you look at the first Texas Symposium, you will see the name of the four organizers. The four of them were all part of this general relativity community, were not astrophysicists, were not those who discovered the quasar, were the people who tried immediately, because the community was already there, that immediately to put the community to this field. So this is what happened. There were Robinson, there were Bergman, uh, Shield. I mean, these were the people who said we were relativists, theoretical relativists who said, well, we have to keep in this feed. So they built a bridge. Then there were a lot of controversy, the which cultural academic controversy between the general relativity community organization and the Texas Symposium. And this is exactly the problem of how to organize the conference, whether they should be open or by invitation. This was exactly the problem because the Texas Symposium, if you look at the, <laughs> very funny if you look at the reviews by Mercier, were seen as essentially a mess of people going there and talking about very different things. But they wanted to have a generative community which was focused on generativity and tried to build a field which was solid, robust in its own ways. So there were controversies that still, in my view, are similar to the early controversies about whether to have an open uh, between the Anglo-American, essentially, the more continental European academic culture about how to organize this conference, very similar. So relativistic astrophysics at the beginning was seen because of the way uh, Texas conferences were organized, versus as a competitor, but most, mostly from the perspective of uh, academic culture. I would say this is um, the response I can give, but of course, uh, it was very important. It changed the field completely, and that um, 1971 was already clearly uh, going in that direction um, most most strongly. As a, I mean, observational uh, cosmology, astrophysics, relativistic astrophysics were become major, major black holes were make, becoming major, major topics at the GRG conferences in 68, 71. Okay, thank you. I think we really need to move on at this point. Uh, uh, there's a link by Donna Salisbury in, uh, in the chat for people who are interested in the Texas uh, Symposium from 1963. Um, okay, Virginia, uh, take it away, please. Yes. Progress is being made, I can tell. Yes. Can we get rid of that little goodie up there? Yes, and since I'm much older than Roberto, I have a much less technologically sophisticated. I'm sorry, but I don't see your screen. The generation that came on. It says ah. that you started screen sharing, but I don't see your screen. Okay, now I can, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we knew that. Um, 
Um, <laughs> sorry. That uh, there. Okay. So I went to the library and I got this the skinniest book on relativity that the library had in 1962. It looked like this. This this one's been rebounded. It still looks like this. It's still the skinniest introduction to general relativity on board. And by the time I got to graduate school, um, there had been no relativity at Caltech since Robertson died, but Kip Thorne arrived in 66, I guess, and taught a general relativity course. And this book has contributed not only to the intellectual development of the field, but to the physical development of the field, because most relativists can only just barely lift it. Wonderful book. I still have markers from what I was teaching the course last year. Okay. Um, oh, no, that was, was that supposed, that's supposed to make things go forward. Okay. Um, I call this a shoe latchet problem. Another thing to call it possibly is the fact that we live on shoulders of giants. There's a whole book about this. But uh, Thucydides must have had this problem when he first started writing history, umpteen years BCE. Um, the uh, fact is we have to talk about people who were clearly our own superiors. And really, you know, all of this is the fault of Sir Arthur Eddington. He's, Lifelong best friend, in fact, was a Trimble, though not a re relative. But when the IAU was founded in 1919, the very first commission was relativity with Arthur Stanley Eddington as his founding president. In 1925, they voted themselves out of existence because nothing else to be done for which international connections would be useful. And of the original members of the commission, only Eddington and Levi Civita were actually there. But you should see what Eddington did to the pre as president of Commission 35 Stellar Constitution at two later general assemblies. There's nothing to be done that is not better done individually, and there is no such thing as relativistic degeneracy. In due course, Chandrasekhar became the president of that commission, and he believed in both co cooperation and relativistic degeneracy. Eddington was actually ev eventually elected president of the International Astronomical Union and served from 1938 until his death in 1944. And he then favored international collaboration, but apparently only when it wasn't his territory. You're going to see some of the same pictures. What am I doing wrong? If that's forward. Yeah, that one should work too. But... Okay, <laughs> that's forward. Um, here is an introduction clockwise from the left. Falk, Infeld, Troutman, Pauli, Tonalot, Mercier. That's the same picture of Mercier that you saw in Roberto's presentation. It's from a newspaper. Mercier winning a prize. That's the only one of these images I had actually had to pay for. The rest were all found online free. This is forward. Oh, we'll try it. Yeah. First advice to students, pay attention to what's going on around you because someday you'll be the only one who remembers. More of the organizers of the first GRs, Dushnerovitz, Miller, Rosen, Bryce DeWitt, Cecile DeWitt, some of these are the same pictures you saw before, some are different. Let me say about Cecile right now that she made a wonderful contribution to advances of women in science. When she and Bryce Seelig met and married, they chose the DeWitt name to share, but she grabbed back her birth name and became known as Cecile Moret DeWitt. I never had to do that. I just kept the name I was born with, but she made a major advance for all of us. You'll meet nearly all these people again in some other context, but there they are as founders of GR zero to seven. This was clearly an idea whose time had come because there were similar events in other organizations. 1970, the International Astronomical Union founded its commissions. Remember relativity was voted out of existence in 25. It's commissions on cosmology and high energy astrophysics. American Astronomical Society, its division, High Energy Astrophysics in 69, American Physical Society, its division of cosmic physics, later astrophysics in 1970. The founders of cosmic physics were mostly cosmic ray people. The events at the Texas Symposium in 1970 and 72, and yeah, I was there too. But on the other hand, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics took a long time to get settled, and the International Mathematical Union has never quite had relativity as part of its remit. 
all these international unions were basically founded in 1919 under provisions of the Versailles Treaty and other settlements of World War I. The Division of Cosmic Physics and High Energy Astrophysics have tried to have joint meetings. It never really worked. And there's another one, when I was president of both of them, I think, we tried to have another joint meeting. We crashed on the timing of coffee breaks. So here are some more founders. This is the updated. Oh, by the way, I'm trying to do something incredibly stupid. Not only don't I recognize people by their shoulders, I don't recognize them by their faces. I'm very bad at that. And so a few of these people will be misidentified. If anybody puts into the chat box corrections to any of these identifications or names for the missing people, I would be very grateful. But here are some more GRG people. Catanio, Peter Bergman, Rosenfeld, Wheeler, Singh, Ibanenko. Um, oh, there's a missing, I lost, I lost an image. It was the doomed commission of the first relativity commission of the IAU, and it should have had Levi Civita, De Sitter, and De Donder, as well as, as Eddington forward. Yes, these are the meetings since Copenhagen. Um, the starred ones, I was there. I have stories from Copenhagen, Tel Aviv, Jena, um, Boulder, maybe New York and Valencia. But um, what happened was first, there was a change in the pattern. For a number of years, the person who'd organized meeting N became chair or president for meeting N plus one. Waterloo was organized largely by Werner Israel, and he didn't want to be president. So if you look down the list, you'll see he got caught later for a meeting that was organized by Narakar and Dadich in Pune. And so Peter Bergman took over Waterloo, Canada. And we have Yvonne Shoke, Bruja, Dennis Shiyama, Ted Newman, George Ellis, Roger Penrose. Actually, the first, the current president and the immediately past president are the only ones in this list I didn't know. <laughs> And GRG started meeting with the Amaldi conferences organized by Raymond Ruffini. Here, I think we have some mathematicians. Yes, Cartan, Jordan, Klein, and who? Anybody recognizes that chap in the lower left, please enter it in the chat box. These are some of the people, again, that Roberto mentioned, but they're different pictures at different times in their lives. And it happens fairly often that somebody you thought you knew well, you knew them when they were young or when they were old, and a picture from 50 years before or after isn't even recognizable. Though I'm, I said, I'm one occasion each, I failed to recognize my own father and my own husband, and I'd known both of them for many years. Advice to students again if you have a second language at home, don't lose it. You are undoubtedly aware that Roberto was speaking in what is probably a second or third or fourth language, and superbly well, there's no doubt about that. On the other hand, Trimble speaks good American. The Hollywood California dialect, a little English. No habla nada de español. I told her I could dance, which was useful in Copenhagen. I know that CCP is USSR and that now is now, which is science. I know two Chinese characters, the one that goes with neutron star in Middle Kingdom and the one that goes with observatory names, which is a mountain. And I know slightly more of ancient Egyptian. And I've cheated by breaking the words in different colors so that if you ever want to read Egyptian, you will know this it says the sun rises in the sky and the scribe, the scribe descends into the boat. My boat didn't work very well. I tried a better boat and finally decided to walk in ancient Egyptian. Yes, here are the pioneering women. Most of them, Cecile Moret DeWitt, Bruria Kaufman, who hasn't been mentioned before. Um, we'll hit Bruria in a minute. Yvonne Choquet Bruja, Marie Antoinette Tonalat, um, the, the French had more women in relativity than any other nation for quite a while. This was partly, I think, Lishnerovitz, who, whose family clearly came from Poland, but he himself was, was, uh, was Andre and was French. What do we have? Yeah, some of the women. Um, Madame Tonalot used her husband's name. She'd studied with, it's there somewhere, <laughs> with, with uh, De Broglie and Perrin and started out in radioactivity. Bria Kaufman is a very curious character. Um, she did a PhD at Columbia, but you could follow her through her life, first to Palestine to meet Emanuel Velikovsky, who interviewed Einstein very late in Einstein's life 
And Einstein in his own memoir says that Velikovsky wasn't an idiot, he was just wrong. But you then follow Gloria Kaufman to Princeton to meet Einstein and von Neumann and to Arizona to meet Willis Lamb, whom she married. They divorced thereafter. Here is Cecile Moret, do it. Um, he, she did her thesis with Heitler and again de Broglie. And they did joint eclipse expeditions, one to Mauritania to do the light bending experiment again, not long before the radio people took that over. Um, I wonder what happens if I try to go back. No, not, not, that, not back that far. Um, yeah, that was where I wanted to go. Um, was it? Oh, Yvonne. Um, I have to tell you about Yvonne's daughter, Jean-Vier. Uh, some Jim GR meeting, I don't even know which one. Uh, Yvonne had brought a car. She and Joe were in the front seat talking science. I was in the back seat with 12-year-old jean Vieux, who insisted we speak French. I'm sure her English was much better than my French, but she was a superb teacher. If I mispronounced a word, she'd use the word in her next sentence correctly. If I got a verb tense wrong, she would bring out the correct verb tense without ever telling me I'd been wrong. She, I believe, is a, med a medical doctor now, and I bet she's a great medical doctor. And here is Stamatia Mavrides, who was always called Mademoiselle Mavrides, and indeed she never married. And she is hard to trace. She was at Royaumont. Her career and life were all in France. She was elected to the International Astronomical Union and joined the Commission on Galaxies that I headed at one time in cosmology. And she spent her life and died, I think, at Moudon, France, but she's not well remembered even there. Now we have, now we have lots of women in relativity. I've picked out two because they happen to be in a book I know about: Gabby Gonzalez, who I think is on this call, and Vicky Calajaris, born in Greece. And their PhDs are just about fifty years after this generation of founders. But there they are, and there's the book in which they've writ written chapters. There's Vicky and there's Gabby, both very good looking. This is not a coincidence, frankly. Does gravitational radiation exist? Even what are you gonna call it? Gravitational waves? What are you gonna call NMR? Nuclear magnetic resonance. No, people are afraid of nuclear. So it gets called MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And to a certain extent, I think fear of the word radiation drove the choice that most people call them gravitational waves now. That was a LIGO decision among other things. Um, yes, there are solutions that are cosine kx minus omega t. Yeah, that makes waves. Carrying energy away if there are other forces involved. This was a Gedanken experiment by Richard Feynman, and it involves physical things that have electromagnetic forces. What if the system is masses interacting only gravitationally? Leopold Infeld, 1898 Krakow to 1968 Warsaw, went to his grave sure that there were not gravitational waves that carried energy away from the system because they could be transformed away by tra a coordinate transformation. <laughs> um, a fascinating autobiography, and you can trace him as well on the Mathematics Genealogy Project, which is a fun thing. If you trace yourself, you can probably go back to Tusi of the Tusi couple and to, to Newton and you know Kepler, whatever you want. But onward, Infeld was not at Royaumont, and Peter Bergman in his concluding remarks says it would be unfair to vote on gravitational radiation when Infeld wasn't there. And he hoped that Infeld would be at the next GR meeting, but in fact, he was not. He died uh, after a fairly lingering illness. He had an odd genetic problem, I believe, and a fascinating history. I recommend the Math Genealogy Project. You can, they take, they take uh, donations and their wikis, of course. So on then to Adrian Scheidegger, who was not Infeld's student, but was very much influenced by him, basically Swiss. He was a geologist, quite a distinguished one, but he was strongly influenced by Infeld in the Canada days. And he in turn hands on to Angelo Langer at, at Milan, who's still writing papers saying that gravitational waves don't exist with a younger female associate who looks like young on the, online at least. But you know, most of us do our best. We tried this thing, an experiment on Monday and I was clear my gray hair showed, so I tinted it. Um, but Tiziana Mar Marcico, I think looks young in any case. But from now, 1975 on, 
cell of eon probably maybe the next year after that gravitational radiation exists and joe weber didn't discover it his reputation has improved considerably since his death it's curious ah uh, the mathematicians this is the international mathematics conference which had a lot more stability than the international union of, of mathematics but at least two of of our people were plenaries there um there is girdle there's got to be a pun about putting a girdle around the the world but i don't know what it is and there's roger penrose a hero of many communities which penrose story should we have well we just say about roger penrose and he has this in common i think with richard Feynman, that when you hear a lecture by him it's invariably exciting and and, and uh, inspiring but when you get home you can't actually do any calculations that you couldn't do before i want to touch briefly on this issue of gr five six and seven and what was allowed and what was not here we see beckenstein of hawking beckenstein radiation here is engelbert shooking the fourth founder of of the texas symposium who didn't get mentioned Ivor Robinson, Moshe Carmeli, Alfred Schild, Moshe Perez. Incidentally, I got to Copenhagen because it was Alfred Schild who invited me. And this angered Felix Pirani, who'd been Schild's student. Schild himself was a student of, of Leopold Infeld. Um, what do I want to say about these things? Well, <laughs> the Israelis are all Jewish. Shuking had a middle name that would make you think he was Jewish, but he was a student of, of Pascal Jordan, a classic anti-Semite. And so I've never been sure about tricking. It doesn't matter anymore. Meg, members, memories of Copenhagen, invitation only, that changed. But my, mine came from Al Schild. Al Schild was a great believer in early marriage and he thought there was somebody coming to that meeting that I should, should get to know better. He meant, well, it just didn't work out. Um, Falk turned off his hearing aid before the Russians all walked out and some of the Eastern Europeans. There was a little cluster of us from Cambridge that included Steve Hawking, Martin Rees, and me. And we had heard Weber's talk at the beginning of the meeting and had the bright idea that the events might be caused by the crab pulsar passing through a resonance. We went on Wednesday or Thursday to ask Weber about this, but he'd left because his first wife, Anita Strauss, had died suddenly during the meeting. Dennis Shiyama gave a talk, where he, something he wasn't quite sure about. And Steve Hawking was at the back of the room in a wheelchair. And Shyama says, isn't that right, Steve? And from Hawking, you get, no, very firm. The closing business session, um, they stood in memory of Mrs. Weber. Here are some of the Russians that joined at various times. Again, clockwise from upper left. Um, Vitaly Lazarevich Ginsburg, Novikov, Friedman of the Friedman Solutions, Belinsky, Kolotnikov, Lifshitz, I have a Lifshitz story, uh, Brzezinski, Shklovsky, Zeldovich, and who? I meant to have Petrov, but I don't think that's Petrov. Again, if you know, put it in the chat room, please. Um, Lifshitz was at the Padua GR meeting, and we had a drink with him someplace sometime, and he brought out his external passport to show he had to give up his internal passport to get an external passport to come to the meeting. And we Americans didn't have to do anything like that. Joe and I thought for a second, we pulled out our American Express cards, <laughs> the equivalent of an American uh, external passport. Skrovsky, Zeldovich, and Ginsburg headed up three theoretical astrophysics groups. And there was a controversy about credit for the idea of the X-ray binaries, which were discovered just a little earlier than quasars, pulsars, well, then pulsars in the GR background, and the idea that they were accretion on neutron stars. And Ginsburg gets the last word because he outlived the other two, though he said he didn't care about priorities and credit. On the other hand, Zeldovich, with the inspiration of one of his students, Akte Guzenov, who was from Azerbaijan, um, actually figured out a way to hunt for them. It didn't, well, the method that Zeldovich and Guzenov advocated in 1966-67 actually was the one that led to the discovery of the black hole in Cygnus X1. There was an intermediate stage where Thorne and Trimble tried again the method. We just didn't have enough data. The particular star that should have been in the catalog wasn't. So we go on to Tel Aviv. 
At that time, there were still lots of Ashkenazi immigrants who spoke Yiddish, which had been Weber's first language. The minutes of 1971 were read, including the standing in memory of Mrs. Weber. I by then had been Joe's wife for more than two years, but I never used his name. I'm not quite sure why, except with him and his sons, there were already two or three Dr. Webers, and I was my father's only child. And so I've continued to use the Trimble name. But the conference tour, we saw a dead camel in the road. I'd never seen a dead camel before. The bus got a, a flat tire. Nathan Rosen got out of the tour bus to help change the tire. He'd become a real Israeli. You do your fair share of the work. They were required garments for the sanctuary part of a tour. Dull blue sheets were given to the men to wrap around their legs if they were wearing uh, shorts. The gals didn't have to wear hats. The Catholic Church had just changed its mind, but you had to have bare arms unless you spoke Greek. You had to cover your arms. Now, most of the guys, it was hot. Most of the guys were not wearing jackets. And so at this meeting, I learned Professor Miller is a man who will give you the coat off his back, but reluctantly. I said, shoe latchet problem. There was less hostility, I think, to Weber's events there than had been in Texas, but it was a different group. And I actually gave the to talk for the Texas Symposium in 72 in New York. Some more pioneers, again from the left, Vanish Hoffman, Ted Newman, Pirani, Goldberg, and Stan Deser, uh, when he had a little more hair than you'll see in the next presentation. Memories Vienna. You had to go through Checkpoint Charlie, and there were umpteen different lines to get from West Berlin, you could fly into, to East Berlin to take a train. Um, they were labeled in German, perfectly reasonable German speaking country. And there was one that said Berliners, okay. And people passed with German East and West passports, apparently working or living in Berlin passed fairly freely through the border. Um, but there was a line that said Auslander. That obviously meant foreigner, but Joe was sure it meant <laughs> outlandish and refused to stand in that line. So we had to go through the Berlin line first and then join the Auslander line. We got to see the primordial Zeiss Planetarium. We got to see the hilltop where the mayor hosted a luncheon with Russian champagne and Albanian cigarettes. They were hard to keep lit. I've never smoked, but you give me a cigarette of a nation I've never tried, I'm gonna try it. And they were hard to keep lit. Zeldovich was there with his wife, Angelica. The GRG committing, Joe had been elected to the GRG committee early when they had first the first elections. I think it was a sympathy for death of Anita. But meanwhile, Zeldovich took um, Angelica and me for vodka and a decent dessert with lots and lots of whipped cream. He also asked, he'd heard I could sing, would I sing for them? Um, Joe and I looked at each other and started a kiddish, a tune you would Jews associate with the name of Lewandowski, an Eastern European tune. And Yasha clearly knew that tune. His, his grandfather had been observant, though he of course was not. That, that, of course, um, modern relativists nearly all say that they're, they're um, atheists. That isn't true for Charlie Misner, who's a serious Catholic. More Germans. Um, there's Trader, Heckman, Schutz, Schmutzer, and somebody I didn't recognize. Um, Heckman has an interesting biography as well. He was director general of the European Southern Observatory. He was president of the IAU. He was also during the latter part of World War II, a member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. He refereed the first paper that came out of my thesis. Was there ever a graduate student who didn't feel that her thesis had been refereed by a Nazi? I only just barely met him. And I, it's clear that he joined the party in order to be able to protect the people at the observatory department that he then headed. Here are some of the Brits, Kilmister, somebody whose name I don't know again, either Bonner or Whitrow, please put in the chat room, we get these right. And Sir William McRae, who lived a long life where he contributed to relativity and to many alternative cosmologies and to the idea that he couldn't think of any way to measure the cosmological constant independent of all the other parameters. That's still more or less true, it turns out. But he also lived long enough to attend the centenaries the, at the Royal Society held to mark the birth of Maxwell and the death of Maxwell. And he took me to the one that marked the death of Maxwell, but that's a different set of stories. Some later evolution of these biennial meetings, increasing similarity among the meetings of ISGRG, the Texas Symposium, IAU, American Physical Society, 
AAS, EAS, probably others, not so much the Royal Astronomical Society or the Astronomical Gesellschaft. Incidentally, the, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, Germans keep good records. The Astronomical Gesellschaft has a little book with all the people who ever belonged. And it's a very, very interesting list. You could probably buy it. Everybody has adopted plenary sessions, but also parallel sessions with contributed papers. You don't need an invitation any place now. You just sign up and pay the registration fee. <laughs> Um, posters from the 80s and now e-posters. Nobody goes to the business meetings anymore, unlike Copenhagen that we all went to. They're now prize talks and one minute, minute pop-ups. The venues are scattered all over the place. New York GRG fairly recently was at Columbia. There were buildings at every end of the campus, not really terribly handicapped accessible. The territories of communities are overlapping where individuals have specialized far more. The founders of the Division of Cosmic Physics had the IU Committee, Commission on, Gen on High Energy Astrophysics had a lot of overlap. It would be interesting, I think, to look at participant lists of recent and intermediate time meetings of GRG, the IAU, and some of the other organizations to see if lots of people still belong to more than one of these committees. Here is Lumetra, easy to recognize. He always wore his cler clerical collar. Bertotti, who organized a meeting in Italy. Lawrence of the Lawrence Fitzgerald Contraction. And a nice picture of Richard Feynman. Yes, I have a lot of Feynman stories, but I'm not gonna tell them here. An interesting, odd, missing cluster of people. Serber, Snyder, and Volkov all did pre-World War II theses, misspelled, sorry, on neutron stars, continued gravitational collapse and so forth with J. Robert Oppenheimer. None of them, those three, ever published anything in GR or astrophysics again. I don't know quite why. Oppenheimer himself took a stab at return. He came to two Solvay conferences, not apparently an overwhelming success. He was at the first Texas with his brother, Frank. He died soon after third Texas and before the next Solvay, which he was again to be president. You can look up conference proceedings as well though and discover that before and after 1953-54, he participated in lots of particle physics conferences and he was not the same person after they took away his, his, his clearance. Here are some of the peacemakers from the 74-77 controversies. There's Werner Israel, Louis Witten, Rahman, Walter Bada, Shyama, uh, Goldberg, Vaidya. Uh, some people are missing that should be on this list. I have two last people I want to introduce you to. One is Jocelyn Bell, whom I've known since we were both brand new postdocs. She's often asked to tell the story of the discovery of pulsars. And one fine day she said, you know, there comes a time when you no longer remember what happened. You only remember how you told the story last time. Watch out for that when you do oral histories, gentlemen and ladies. And I would like also to mention Raymond Arthur Littleton. Um, Again, someone who dabbled in relativity, at least. He managed to be on the wrong side of every scientific controversy from about 1935 until his death in, I think, the early years of the present century. But he said, one of the real pleasures of meeting somebody new was a chance to play your tapes again. So thank you for the opportunity to play my tapes again. Back to you, Mr. President. How do I cut out? You don't cut out. That's good. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to get some more questions. I see people clapping, but I don't see raised hands. Has, can't anybody contribute the names that I got wrong? Anybody some fix people, it? Some people did leave uh, comments in the chat. Charles says the braided male top is Bill Bonner. Oh, okay. I had a 50-50 chance. Um, Bill Bonner, okay. Um, any questions? Yeah, I, I, I know about Salisbury. Uh, we're, on, we're on a committee together. <laughs> Is there any, anybody else providing information? No? 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 I guess it's, well, hello to everybody. I didn't get it. I saw Gaby, I said, I waved at Kip. Um, is the Docor who's on this, the son of the Docor, 
who was on ER, early GRGs. He may have gone away. Um, he's right there. George, are you the son of a docor who was a relativist? No answer. People have gone back to work. Hi, Gabby. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. <laughs> thank you for listening. Okay, okay. Um, hand, hand over to Stan Dezer, I think. I will. Um, I'm gonna give people another 15 seconds, just in case there's a question we didn't catch. If not, I can set up and start the video by Stan. Okay, guess I'm gonna do that. So let's see. Can you see the video right now? Yep. Yes. Okay, very good. And I'll try to go all the way to the beginning. A little bit too. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And I'll play it for you, okay? Please let me know if the audio doesn't work or anything goes wrong. It's a great honor to have been allotted 30 minutes to summarize 70 years of uh, work in my general relativity for the society. In case I happen to overshoot by I suggest that you look at a number of my recent postings, as well as my recently published autobiography, Force in the Road by World Scientific. That was a plug. Okay, so let me, I've been asked to, in particular to address six points. So the first one I will address as part of a more general picture which is, how did I start? When I came to graduate school at Harvard in 1949 and got my PhD in 53, the word general relativity was never, never mentioned by anyone whatsoever during that whole period, including the course I took called relativity. It simply was not on the map. Thereafter, I came to the Institute for Advanced Study, which is where Oppenheimer advised all of us new postdocs to have nothing to do with an old fool down the hall. <laughs> Technically, he was right in that by that point, Einstein was unfortunately completely lost in his own little world. But that's like saying, Newton was an old mist of this century, and indeed Oppenheimer's one immortal paper is in general relativity, <laughs> so it seems a bit ironic. In any case, his dictum was not difficult to follow since A, I didn't know what general relativity was, B, Einstein was never his mysterious office and so on. Nobody knew where he was. However, <laughs> during my second year, towards the close of my second year, I got a hot tip that Einstein would be talking and uh, he would give these seminars occasionally in an unmarked room somewhere in the Institute. When I stumbled into it, there he was. In German, he talked for an hour on his latest calculation. Since I wouldn't have known his second latest calculation either, it was pure tourism on my part. But that is indeed the story of the old fool. I think it was one of Oppenheimer's many unwise remarks. <laughs> I had met a rather coward in the back of the Institute van once when in Eisenhower, when <clears throat> Einstein and I shared it during a rainstorm, but we had no connection otherwise. So this was in the, just before Einstein died, early spring of 1955, which brings me to the, Next historical requested moment, which is 
my recollections of GRG0 and what GR1 as they are now known. So GR0 was the first, although it didn't know it was the first, of a series of international general relativity conferences. It had been then set up for 1955 for the obvious reason that it marked 50 years of special 40 years of general relativity and was held fittingly enough in Bern. And at that point, I was a I had begun another stint as a postdoc in the Niels Bohr Institute, where the word general relativity was equally totally unknown. But I thought I had a card. I was touring around Europe, and I thought it might be fun to be another tourist this time. So what turned out to be GR0 was held in the Bern Natural History Museum, where we had to go through a whole cases of stuffed primates in order to get to the auditorium, where a bunch of equally, not stuffed, but pretty old primates, all the old <laughs> GR generation, which I thought of only as names and textbooks, they were all there. Fokker and Violin, and all sorts of other relativity connected grades. Pauli, Pauli incidentally, was perhaps the first person to understand general relativity at the age of 18 when uh, he wrote a book about it. There's a famous anecdote where um, Eddington, who was, of course, a very, a very arrogant character who was asked by reporters, uh, Professor Eddington, they say there are only three people who generally understand general relativity, to which Eddington replied, who's the third? And of course, Pauli was ahead of him. In any case, there were four of us, as I wrote in my memoir, <clears throat> who were under the age of whatever it was, 90, and that was Felix Pirani, who was the only genuine relativist, and the other two, Wally Gilbert and um, John Moffat, were doing other things just like I. So we congregated uh, for obvious bosonic reasons, since there was no other person of any age near ours. And uh, of course, I learned nothing except stand in awe of all these people. So that's that was GR0. And what is now popularly known as GR1 was held in Chapel Hill in January 57, which I had flew back from Copenhagen to attend because I was job hunting at that point. <clears throat> and I then, people always talk about Feynman being there and giving a historic lecture. It was not really very historic, but I made the mistake of giving a completely nonsense lecture about general relativity as a po possible universal cutoff to the problems of quantum field theory in the ultraviolet. And he rightly took me, tore me to pieces, which managed it was probably unrelated, but then I got the worst flu I ever had in my life. And he came to visit me, I guess, out of okay. some kind of feeling that he had caused it. He came to my room all the time. So that was GR1. And then, and then, although it doesn't seem to be counted officially, there came Royaumont in the summer of uh, 58, was it? Yes. Uh, so 50, January 57, summer 58, Wyoming was a newly established, um, there was an abbey near Paris in which meetings were supposed to be held. And it was at that point 
that uh, the beginnings of ADM were presented, which brings me having gone, oh yeah, well, let me just go through another GR, the next GR, the real GR was held in Warsaw, the summer of 62, or rather in a place called Yablona, which was the Versailles of Warsaw, and attended by all sorts of greats, including Dirac and Earl Finer and me. Uh, so I should, yeah, so, Let me talk about, because after all, it was a central point in my career, ADM, as I was asked to discuss its origins and its um, after, meaning and aftermath. And the origins are rather amusing. After my Copenhagen stay, I came back as a, an instructor to Harvard for a year and worked on the then fashionable <coughs> dispersion theory. It was worth a year, but no more. At the end of that, quantum field theory, then it's quantum electrodynamics at the time was sort of laid out. And uh, Dick Arnold went, who had been one of my close graduate school classmates, and I, started thinking about what would be the next good thing to do. Well, since QFT was gone, that was spin one and zero and spin a half had been played out and spin three halves could never have been thought of as yet. It was a time was not right. We'll come back to that. Came, so we thought next step is spin two. And we knew in a very vague way, that that must have something to do with general relativity. So we set about with all our brilliant Schwinger, my PhD advisor, to whom we will also return. I set about, Nick and I set about using all the machinery we had learned, all the formal stuff. We set about, uh, trying to use it, at least on the linearized theory. Now, the history of that was that Pauli and Fiertz, or Fiertz and Pauli in the early 30s, had attacked it with the, the then available artillery, as well as a guy called Matvei Bronstein in St. Petersburg, or in Leningrad, I should say, <coughs> about 35. Poor Bronstein shared the last day with Trotsky and a similar fate as well. He was one of the early victims of the terror, Stalin's terror, right guy. So what Dick and I did was to attack a free spin two field. That is the same level that Fierce, Pauli and Bronstein did but in modern language. And we managed a paper, which at the time was not unreasonable, explaining its properties. So Dick and I, after everything had been done, tried to think of what the next interesting step might be. Spin zero, spin a half, spin one, we're all exhausted. This was still pre yang Mills, but post QED. Spin three halves was yet to come, as I will discuss. That left uh, at that point spin two, which he and I knew vaguely knew was better known as uh, general relativity's linear approximation. And we used all the formal tools we had learned from Julian Schwinger, who was our advisor, the, on different topics, PhD topics. Uh, to disanalyze and formalize the free spin two field. And we were reasonably satisfied with the fact we called it 
the Roman numeral one in the hope that someday. So in those days when you did something and wanted to, there was no archive, no internet. So what you did was send mimeographed almost illegible copies to a number of labs which you thought worthy of having it, and they would have racks with displays. They would change every week. So one of the places we sent it to was Princeton. And at that point, Wheeler, John Archibald Wheeler, was himself waking up to general relativity. And he got interested in the paper and summoned us to Princeton. For once, we were there not just as a postdoc or a tourist, but to dispense research results. And he said he, he had a habit that everyone who knew him still remembers. He had beautiful bound rag paper notebooks lined and bound. And he had a tape recorder, which in those days was the size of a battleship. <laughs> and he started talking to us. And as he heard us, he said, hold it right there. I have a very bright student who might be very relevant to what you're telling us. We brought in this kid called Charlie Misner. I'd actually met him at Chapel Hill, but didn't really know him. So Charlie sat there. We said our bit. And then Charlie pointed out what he knew, what he had done. And this was, of course, he was a genuine relativist, so what he had done was find a really amazing formulation of general relativity. He didn't quite know what it meant, but there he had it. And Dick and I looked at each other, and then Wheeler said, you know, the three of you might want to collaborate on further work. And we were not about to connect with a lousy graduate student just for that. So we said we will, early said we will think about it. And by the time our train got to Princeton Junction, we said, what idiots we are. And of course, we got to get them. So this is how the M was added to ADM. And there began, this was the beginning of ADM, which lasted from the 1950, well, this was a 57, spring of 58 through 61 or 62, and became a cornucopia of a dozen different original papers in all directions, which we think, I still think is one of the, is probably the greatest advance in GR since Einstein because it de-geometrized general relativity and analyzed it as a field theory. Now, as is well known, today's breakthrough is tomorrow's calibration. So nowadays, many people think of ADM as a great numerical relativity tool. Uh, by the way, this is because it's a three plus one formulation. That is to say, Hamiltonian form of the theory. So that lends itself best for numerical as against analytical uh, studies. However, that is the most unjust or the least interesting and important part of ADM. So I will perhaps expand a tiny bit on its significance and the results it led to. So first of all, we discovered in the full theory now, not linear approximation, but the full theory viewed as a field theory was what is called, what we call an already parameterized theory. Now I have to explain. In the late 19th century, Jacobi 
well-known mathematician, made what seemed like a step backwards in dynamics. And he pointed out that if you took a say a, a single particle action, and time in those days was just Newtonian, of course, you could turn it into a general covariant theory formally by turning the Hamiltonian uh, uh, as a constraint and a time as an undetermined a generic thing that is to say you went from the you added a degree of freedom and at the same time you added a constraint which cancelled each other out and you could just go backwards of course to the ordinary Newtonian uh, description of a particle whatever you had however in the case of general relativity, it was already parameterized and there was no way back. That is, there was no unique, of course, space or time coordinate to appeal to since the theory is intrinsically generally covariant. And so you took to take your picture yourself of what frame to use. And this is what underlies much of the complexity and confusion behind understanding the theory. So, starting from that point of view, that is to say of GR as an already parameterized theory, we explored not least, the most perhaps the what is most um, memorable in addition to exhibiting the existence of gravitational waves unambiguously, was the definition of energy. Now, that was no joke because after I said GR, no lesser pair than Hilbert and Demi Nerther tried to define it. Being mathematicians, they failed because they were too general and didn't realize that you could only define gravity general energy if you had asymptotic flatness okay. solution. It didn't fall off at infinity. You, you neither could nor should define energy for us. So we managed a beautiful full definition known to this day as A, the M, which uh, exactly did right. That is to say, it exists and it is precisely the correct and unique definition. There is no density, there's no meaningful energy density definition in GR because general covariance, but only with asymptotically flat conditions, boundary conditions. And uh, that actually, and I have to say, let us, uh, much later, I'll talk about positive energy. But anyway, so ADM has had enormous conceptual to me, I mean, yeah, it seems to me kind of value, and that it's also used as a numerical tool as all to the good, but we could explore standard quantization possibilities, gravitational radiation, which we nailed down in every possible respect. And, and we wrote, as I say, a dozen papers, which we summarized in the uh, we summarize them in a uh, uh, chapter that was now non existent book, but it's been on now, it's been reprinted in an archive so you can find it. So now that brings me to the next subject. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the great people I've known. But before that, maybe I should talk about supergravity because we're talking physics here. So supergravity was invented by Bruno Zumino and me in 1976 as, as at the same time and independently of uh, 
proved by using computers by Friedman Ferrara of an Hebenheisen. And we did it in a couple of lines because this involved the spin three halves field. Now that's a very interesting animal, which had actually <clears throat> been invented, or not invented, but been formalized by Marina and Schwinger in 1941 and independently in the Soviet Union by uh, Ginsburg, Vitaly Ginsburg. And I simply cannot trace that paper. It was a short letter written in the middle of during the bad phase of the war in the Soviet Union. And then Buchdahl well, discovered that the spin three halves field could only exist in a, in a gravitational field if that gravitational field was reaching flat. Now that sounded like the death knell because that meant it could only be a test field and indeed there couldn't be any sources for it to, other sources for it to exist or the world would not be reaching flat, it would have sources. And when I came to CERN on April 1st, 1976, Bruno Zumino was waiting for me. We started discussing, and I said, I had thought about, you know, I mean, didn't know the word supergravity, discussing the question of how could it be salvaged or not. And he said, Well, remember, there are things called fierce identities which I will not burden you with, but they are identities between products of spinners, quantized, necessarily second quantized. And we set about to see whether the symmetry of spin three halves in flat space, which is a age of variance of the second kind, it reduces the four possible degrees, so the helicities to two helicities, three plus or minus three halves. And it went beautifully smoothly because we both do a great, totally forgot the work by Hermann Klein, Hermann Varla, I mean, Hermann Varla, who talked about torsion for different ways of coupling fermionic fields to gravity. So our proof was just a few lines and uh, it led to the proof, the one proof by title Boyd and me about a year later of positivity of general of gravity of the ADM energy, which as I said, was a really, and I had, slaved away on that problem with many other people for many years. And we did it. We did it in two lines using, because we show that since supergravity and spin three has was a square root of gravity, gravity was positive. I won't go into details, but that was another fall off. Okay, so let me now jump to great people. I have known I'm supposed to give you a history, or at least the names. So Julian Schwinger was the first one. He, of course, knew everything when he was a kid, although, as I say, he never mentioned the word general relativity. But after ADM, he worked on it a little bit again. And after supergravity, he came back again. So he was one. And then, of course, I mentioned Einstein and Pauli. And uh, Feynman worked on various aspects, although I think there was really nothing that he did that was of original value, of something called ghost in quantizing, uh, perturbative quantization, general relativity. Um, then there were Ron Boyd, uh, Miller and Rosenfeld, both of whom were workers in the field. 
and they did share one particular feeling, which was they were two of Dyson was the third who felt general relativity need not be, should not, and need not be quantized. That was a major mistake. They were wrong. And in fact, I just written a little paper showing on elementary grounds why you had to quantize it. So that was two. Miller was, of course, in Copenhagen when I was there, but we never, the word relativity never came out. Rosenfeld used to visit there, likewise. And I knew Bryce DeWitt, of course, from way back from before Chapel Hill. And he was single mindedly devoted to one thing, which is quantizing the theory in incredibly complicated formalism. Uh, Who else? Though I should, of course, mention Dirac. Now, Dirac turned out to be ADM's closest rival. He came along for totally different reasons, and being Dirac, came to roughly the same student definitions as ADM, although he didn't quite work it out as far. But that was his perhaps last big thing. That was in the late 50s. He was at Wyoming, as I said, and in Warsaw. Let's see, who else? Uh, I mean, I knew all the old guys from Infeld to um, Rosen, and all of Einstein's collaborators, Bergman, Bergman. But I think neither, none of those have really left any major impression. So let me, I'm running over time, let me finish. I've been asked to say some final words. Of course, have to be final words. So I would say quantum gravity, quantization of general relativity remains, that consistent, remains one of the great, the great unsolved problem, the unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. Perhaps, and of course it means that we really are not understanding. We have some obviously deeper layer, Ella Wilson, Ken Wilson, which will allow us to unify the two in some meaningful way. However, as a, an effective theory, it has no peers. Its predictions have all been correct all the way down the line. And uh, despite all the new spate of gravitational radiation results that are on, that was were discovered by LIGO, <coughs> and company, and a single flaw has been found. So let me close on that note. It's the greatest wrong theory that was ever invented, and one of the greatest achievements in the human mind. It liberated space time from being just a lousy background to being a dynamical actor. So there are, in fact, there are now no inert, it's all of physics, is dynamical. I will land on that and good luck for future GR. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> the greatest strong theory was ever invented. So on those closing notes, I think we can thank again Roberto and Virginia for wonderful talks. Are there any last questions for them? Okay, if not, I think we can close the meeting here. Thank you so much for attending. And I remind you all that uh, the recording will be made available online for those who can attend live. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much for to the audience. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Thank you very much.